uh, ahead and get started. So um, for those of us that treat individuals that have complaints of dizziness, um, cervicogenic dizziness sometimes gets overlooked. And today my goal for you guys is just to get an overview of some of the components on the evaluation, screening, as well as, you know, what are some tests and measures we use to maybe include a diagnosis of cervicogenic dizziness. At the same time, uh, once we've made a diagnosis of cervicogenic dizziness, what are some interventions that we might impart on these individuals? Um, so my name is Mickey. I am a physical therapist by background. I've been working in the outpatient setting for the past uh, nine years. I've been in a hospital setting six years prior to that. Um, and I see a lot of patients that come in with complaints of dizziness. So uh, cervicogenic dizziness, I've seen three individuals today that have been newly uh, diagnosed this week with cervicogenic dizziness. So although the condition has a lot of controversy, whether or not it exists, um, I've seen it uh, three times this week. And you just have to know what you're looking for. And there has to be a lot of testing done before you even come to the arena of cervicogenic dizziness. So hopefully you guys enjoy the presentation. I can see the chat. So if you guys have questions, just please uh, use the chat function and I'll make sure I kind of scan back and forth uh, for it. Um, so my background, I am an orthopedic therapist as well as a neurotherapist. Uh, I started off in neuro rehab as well as uh, eventually went on to receive an orthopedic fellowship. So what does that mean? For cervicogenic dizziness, I think the background allows. Okay, why can't I hear him? Do you have any idea? Can you guys hear me? Oh my god, you're recording. Can you guys hear me? Yes. All right. So again, my background allows me to bring in perspectives from both the you know, neuro rehab perspective as well as the orthopedic perspective. So it's gonna be a, a nice little blend. Um, I know that I've worked in an outpatient setting where we've had individuals that have had whiplash injuries or concussions, and sometimes I see the, the neuro side get overlooked or the vestibular components or the complaints get overlooked. And at the same time, I've worked in a neuro setting where sometimes the orthopedic complaints get overlooked with these individuals that complain of dizziness. So let's uh, jump right in. So again, it's a brief overview. We're gonna touch on all of these objectives. Uh, we're not gonna dive into great detail, but I think, um, you know, I look at this as a clinician, and if I was a clinician, my goal is to provide uh, enough information that you feel comfortable seeing this person on your schedule um, tomorrow or, or Monday. So the first thing is uh, dizziness, if you work in a, in a clinic that's outpatient, inpatient, it's going to be hard to, to kind of pass up this diagnosis. We see a huge volume of individuals complaining of dizziness. Uh, if you haven't heard of it, we're probably just not asking the right questions. Um, so here's some, some tidbits, or you know, I can go on and on about epidemiology, but it affects about uh, up to 40% of the population. There's even some studies that say up to 69 million Americans will have dizziness at some point in their life. Some um, additional data suggests that as we get older, dizziness, the prevalence increases to the point where if you're over 80, eight to nine out of 10 individuals are gonna have dizziness. Um, again, it's uh, not a singular diet disorder. It's gonna be a cluster of diet disorders. It's a symptom. So um, in another study just pertaining to this course, uh, dizziness was attributed to about 65%, cervicogenic dizziness was um, attributed to about 65% of the total cases. So cervical spondylosis was attributed to the dizziness in 65% of the cases in elderly. So that's again, another telling fact that we should be looking at this. And even though um, cervical dizziness or vertigo, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of change cervical vertigo to dizziness as an independent entity, it still remains controversial. And it's controversial for a number of reasons, but I'll give you a couple. Um, the people on the other side of the spectrum say this is controversial, that we don't have a, a singular test to measure for it. Like we can't just run them through an MRI, CT scan, or do an MRA and say, look, this is the culprit that's causing the dizziness. Um, and it's also controversial such that um, it's, it's not a disorder that's in isolation. We have to do a lot of testing to exclude 
um, other, other problems that might be causing dizziness. And then you can make an argument that once you come to a diagnosis of cervicogenic dizziness, that those symptoms alone can mimic or mirror other vestibular conditions. So again, that becomes really hard. So hopefully after this presentation, I don't give you more confusion, but actually some clinical perils, examination techniques to kind of muddle down through this process. Um, oh, so there's, there's the reasons why uh, the proponents, opponents reject the diagnosis. And, you know, th this is a kind of a theme of a lot of my coursework. And if you're an orthopedic therapist, this is not a new concept, but we're trying to get away from just trying to figure out the exact diagnosis or the exact etiology of conditions. Um, sometimes we don't have the best answer. Times we do, but a lot of times we don't. So rather than trying to come up with a diagnosis, we're coming up with a classification process. So really trying to take in the, the data and um, tested measures and trying to classify patients based on signs, symptoms, impairments, rather than uh, a pathoanatomical tissue. And cervicogenic dizziness as a diagnosis actually fits very well because we're going to actually be looking at a lot of tests and measures, impairments, uh, in order to classify our patient to have cervicogenic dizziness because we don't have a confirming test or measure to actually do this. And then when you just look at the, the tests when they are looked at independently, they don't really have the best diagnostic accuracy. So what we want to do is cluster as many tests as we can in order to, to enhance our evidence that, yes, this person may or may not have cervicogenic dizziness. So you're going to hear me present uh, a few tests that you can utilize and cluster these together to strengthen our, um, our hypothesis for someone having cervicogenic dizziness, not just utilizing one test. And I often hear that a lot when I'm teaching. It's, well, what's the best test that I can use for cervicogenic dizziness or what's the best test I can use for this? And my answer um, is kind of disappointing. It really starts at the entire process. We start at the history. We look at their tests and measures. We look at the results. We impart some treatment, and we look at the outcome of that treatment. So it's really a process of clustering a lot of things together. So what is cervicogenic dizziness? So let's, uh, let's kind of look at that definition in a second. It's a syndrome of postural instability arising from a disturbance of cervical joint receptors. Um, this concept's been around for a long time. Initially, it was termed cervicogenic vertigo, given by Ryan and Cope. Um, but if you actually get to the conclusion of cervicogenic dizziness, these individuals rarely complain of that true vertigo symptom, like the spinning, I'm going to marry you around. They have more complaints of imbalance, a feeling of maybe just kind of an out-of-body out of experience. Their head's not quite sitting right on their shoulders. Um, they might get some symptoms of just brief instability with turning their head or neck. Um, so, so rather than calling it cervical vertigo, we've changed the term to be a little bit more accurate, cervicogenic dizziness, because these individuals will rarely actually experience vertigo. So what causes this? So what's the etiology? So there's several, several proposed mechanisms. I'm just going to talk about three of them. So the first one would be a compression of the vertebral artery. Uh, the second one is irritation of the symp uh, cervical sympathetic plex plexus. And the last one, and actually probably more relevant in our clinical practice, would be the abnormal proprioceptive input from the upper cervical spine. And this includes uh, joint receptors, muscles, tendons, tissues, skin, all of those uh, sensory receptors and mechanoreceptors that are located in the upper cervical spine. We consider the upper cervical spine as CO, C1, or the occiput C1, C1, C2, and C2, C3. So if you just look at the vertebral arteries, um, if you look at that image over there, you can kind of see the vertebral arteries pass through the transverse foramen, C1 through 6. But as you, as you see the vertebral artery, as it gets closer to the top, it makes this like sharp 90 degree turn, and we call that um, the junction root. And that's where we see a lot of this compression happening. So um, we look at that as an area or a source sometimes of the compression. The vertebral artery is very important for perfusing the vestibular system. The vertebral arteries form the vertebral basilar system. And then off the basilar artery, you have the aica, or the anterior inferior cerebellar artery that actually supplies blood to the inner ear 
and to, to parts of the central vestibular system. So very important blood flow pathway. When we look at trying to figure out if somebody actually has vertebral basilar insufficiency or uh, vertebral artery tests that we learned in school, um, you've heard this before, it's not really a good test to use in isolation. It has better specificity than sensitivity. So if somebody has a positive test, you have a better light or more likelihood that they'll actually have a positive vertebral artery test. But if you have them test negative, still can't say that they are testing, they might have vertebral artery involvement. Um, so again, it's pretty, pretty poor test to use. So I just wanted to throw that out there in case some of you guys haven't heard this information. So if we look at some of the potential contributors of vertebral artery um, insufficiency or occlusion, um, you know, instability is a common cause. So if you imagine if somebody has trauma to their capsule ligamentous structures that stabilize C1 and C2, particularly the transverse ligament, you might have anterior slippage of that um, C1 on C2, which could cause some occlusion of the vertebral artery. So that's, uh, that's something to consider. I put in frequent high amplitude manipulations. Um, this is a really uh, common story in my practice and maybe in yours, but we have patients that seek, uh, seek out manipulation or chiropractic care for dizziness. And a lot of times as those rotatory thrust manipulations are actually performed on high amplitude and eventually can cause some overstretching of that capsule ligamentous ring on C1, C2. Um, true story, I spoke to um, a chiropractic professor whose mother came to see me for dizziness and we came to the conclusion of cervicogenic dizziness and I, I asked her I go so what kind of things were you doing and she said she was getting frequent adjustments and manipulations and she felt really sick after that they were imparted again uh, there, there's a response but maybe not a good response probably to avoid treatment I, I talked to the chiropractic physician about this and he said, um, yeah, I got a response, so I know I'm in the right area. Um, very scary, but I, I see this sometimes, so just kind of look out for this. But instability, any trauma that can cause disruption of that stability system can cause occlusion of the vertebral artery. Any osteophytes or bony uh, space occupation in that area that we looked at can cause some compression. You can have muscular compression from the uh, longus coli and the anterior scalene you know, that can actually cut off um, circulation of the vertebral artery. Even uh, prolonged forward head posturing, you know, can actually result in some vertebral artery compression. So those are some things that we want to uh, look at. Um, also, you could have it during some rotatory motion and then combined rotation and extension. Now, if someone's symptomatic, it's hard for us to say, are they symptomatic because of the side that we're compressing or the side that we're tractioning? Um, it's, a, it's really not a, a big area of discussion in clinical practice. We just know that they have maybe some vertebral artery involvement and they might need to seek out additional uh, medical attention. Uh, the second uh, cause might be this posterior cervical sympathetic syndrome or Barry Louis syndrome. And this is uh, a thought that there might be some irritation to the sympathetic vertebral plexus or cervical plexus secondary to cervical dysfunction or arthritis. So again, if you have some bony compression on that cervical plexus, it might cause some reflexive vasoconstriction, which is gonna cause some decreased blood flow to the inner ear, and then again, result in vertigo or dizziness. This is maybe not the, the best proposed mechanism because that we know that central perfusion happens different ways as well, and it might not, answer completely why somebody might be having some dizziness or vertigo. So that's the second uh, cause. And then the more accepted is that abnormal proprioceptive input. So I looked, I look at this diagram, I adapted it from Herdman's textbook. And if you look at how we process equilibrium or how we process upright balance, how do we process um, maintaining great gaze or, or eye stability is we have sensory inputs. Those inputs are processed on, on the brainstem and then the cerebellum. That information is communicated back to muscles of the eye to coordinate gaze stability or muscles of your uh, or postural control muscles to provide balance and, and stability. So these proprioceptive input um, primarily comes from the cervical spine. 
And when you take away that input, or if you've impaired that input, you're going to have an output problem. So think of this, for example, and I've had, I've had this, uh, I've given this example quite a bit to my patients, which kind of helps them is if you turn your head to the right and you're looking, you're looking to the right, your eyes tell you you're looking to the right. Your inner ear, the fluid moves in the, in the semicircular canals and stimulates the vestibular hair cells, tells you that you're looking to the right. And then the and impaired proprioceptors in the neck may give some alternative information. They might not say you're turned to the right at, at the same rate that your eyes and your inner ear might be telling you. And that's where you're going to get that. We call it sensory, sensory neural or sensory motor mismatch, causing that disequilibrium and dizziness. And then if you look at the vestibular nuclei, so these are um, nuclei that are located on the pontomedullary junction of the brainstem. You know, if you just look at all the different connections they have, I call this central station, like it communicates with um, the vestibular uh, system, it communicates with the cerebellum, it communicates with the cervical proprioceptors. And that vestibular nuclear complex is responsible for taking in information from several different sources, processing it, sending it back to the cerebellum, and then the cerebellum tells, tells the vestibular nuclei if there's an error, do we need to make adjustments prior to making that um, ascending and descending output via the VOR or VSR. But if you just look at how much information goes in there, cervical proprioceptors are, um, are a huge part of that information that comes in. So this theoretical hypothesis is that there's inaccurate proprioceptive input from the sensory and mechanoreceptors in the upper cervical spine, creating that sensory mismatch between vestibular and proprioceptive inputs. So with this, you're going to have impaired postural control. There's going to be individuals that have instability with their balance, and they're going to be usually worse with um, head motion. A lot of times is that head motion, if they're slow, they won't be provoked, but it might be just during quick head movements or quick head, head motion. Now, we know that from our tremendous amount of research on whiplash-associated disorders, that when those muscles are traumatized, it will affect the cervical muscle firing rate. And in turn, this is going to affect postural control. Um, it's going to affect equilibrium, and it's also going to affect um, patients to the point where they might have impaired ocular motor function as well. And an astounding 60% of patients with whiplash-associated disorders will report dizziness. So that's a really high number. Um, so the fact that that can cause under trauma some dizziness and imbalance, we know that um, you know, even without trauma it has the potential of doing that with perhaps maybe a repetitive straining of those muscles, creating an impaired, um, impaired proprioception. Uh, you know, for example, if you look at some folks that have been sitting in front of a computer with a huge forward head posture for years and years and years, that might also alter cervical muscle firing rate. And then with whiplash-associated disorders, if you look at all the, 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 the contributors to those symptoms, it's not in isolation of just the neck, right? We have the cervical spine that might be affected, the vestibular system might be affected. We know that some of these individuals might actually have developed um, post-concussive symptoms. Um, and there's also other symptoms associated as well as, um, you know, psychogenic um, photophobia and things like that. So, you know, the, the goal of this presentation is not to discuss whiplash-associated disorders, but just to know that the cervical spine is a huge con contributor with that and that the cervical spine can generate dizziness due to impaired proprioceptive input. And then here's, here's a really take home message here. So maybe on the chat, if you guys can just tell me if you have some experience treating vestibular conditions, because cervicogenic dizziness is, is, is considered a diagnosis by exclusion. So before we just jump to the diagnosis of cervicogenic dizziness in our clinical practice or in my clinical practice, we put these patients through an exhaustive vestibular examination process. We feel confident that we've ruled these individuals out from having BPPV, vestibular hypofunction, um, ototoxicity or, or pharmatoxicity of the vestibular system. We've ruled out central and other peripheral vestibular conditions. So we, we build a body of evidence that suggests that cervicogenic dizziness is um, 
is more accurately diagnosed just based on excluding all these other conditions. So, you know, do pay attention to that. And if you're not sure or comfortable treating vestibular disorders um, and you see a lot of patients that have had whiplash uh, associated disorders or concussion, um, they go hand in hand. So that's my little rant on that. Just to give you an idea of what these other conditions look like that we're actually ruling out, we rule out central and peripheral. So central conditions, we're looking at conditions that arise from the brain. So individuals that have had a stroke, uh, head trauma, or any other neurodegenerative uh, disorders such as MS, um, migraines, uh, tumors, and of course, look at that list of peripheral disorders. Some of those are red flag peripheral disorders, but we spend a lot of time ruling these out before we come to a conclusion of cervicogenic dizziness. You know, sometimes patients might come in and they have all the classic findings of cervicogenic dizziness, but we cannot skip those steps of ruling out other conditions. And what do these other conditions look like? So this is just like a nice treat for those that are not um, experiencing vestibular disorders. Um, we have a patient here. I don't know if the video is playing. Hold on. There we go. So we have a patient that's on um, that says BPPV or on my left. You can kind of see I've turned their head to the right and there's like a slow beating nystagmus. And that's an involuntary eye movement. She has no control over it. I move her head to the left and you see a ramping up of that nystagmus. It's beating a lot faster. Um, so this, this individual has horizontal canal cupulolithiasis um, or BPPV. We have the individual that, you know, you see that label unilateral vestibular hypofunction or UVH. If you look at her eye movement, there's like a slow drift and then a fast beat back to, to midline. And believe it or not, I take this individual that's dizzy and shake her head side to side. And I'm not quite sure about her diagnosis. And once we stop moving the head, you're going to see that quick beating to the left. And it, this is an imbalance of the vestibular systems or a weakness on one side. So these are some common peripheral conditions that will rule out prior to coming to a diagnosis of cervicogenic dizziness. We're looking at this individual. How do we determine whether it's central or peripheral? I'm looking at this individual's eye movements. There's a little bit of a drift here, but I'm not quite sure, um, you know, is it peripheral or central? I have them look to the right and the eyes move faster towards the right. I have them move to the left. They move faster to the left. I have them look up. The eyes move faster as he looks up. And we call this direction changing nystagmus, which is a key finding for someone having a central cause or a component of dizziness. And again, here's another video of someone having a peripheral or inner ear origin of dizziness. And when I first started seeing these videos, um, they all looked the same to me. And just like when I first was in physical therapy school and I was analyzing gait, um, they all look the same. It does take some practice looking at these eye movements to rule out or rule in vestibular conditions. Um, so again, that's just a, a nice little clinical peril um, to our, our vestibular kind of ruling out or diagnosis exclusion. All right, so now let's go, go ahead and do the examination here. So what does the exam look like? Well, the exam looks like, um, you know, first we've screened our individuals for red flags. Do they have any central origin of dizziness that they need to be referred to medical management? Are they coming off a trauma where they haven't been screened yet? Um, after they kind of pass the red flag stage, um, you know, can we exclude other causes of dizziness that might be contributing to this individual's symptoms? 
And once we've done that, can we perform our inclusion or exclusion test, cluster these tests together to come up with a diagnosis of cervicogenic dizziness? And then based on that dizziness, um, cervicogenic dizziness diagnosis, can we come up with the right treatment strategies? So that's the process that we're gonna take here. I always do a systems review. So if you look at the systems review, dizziness, again, is just a, a symptom or a, uh, of multiple possibilities. And if you look at the top, the cervical spine is just one potential possibility. We have to rule out all the other possibilities as well. So we do a cardiovascular screen. Um, we do a, a central and peripheral vestibular screen. I even screen for medications. There's a lot of times when some of our patients are on three, five, seven medications that um, they're just not, they might just have dizziness from uh, drug toxicity. And dizziness is a common side effect of a lot of these medications. Right, so what are some red flags that we're screening for? Um, some yellow flags first, anxiety, stress, depression, orthostatic blood pressure. Red flags we're looking to rule out are cervical spine instability, vertebral basilar insufficiency, myelopathy or spinal cord compression. It will ca cause um, imbalance and ataxia, but it usually doesn't cause dizziness. We're trying to rule out strokes or other neurological conditions and any other cardiac conditions. Um, once they've kind of passed our screen, we move them on to our vestibular and then cervical screen. So here's just a, a video of somebody that we caught here with um, a cerebellar condition, unable to even perform a basic Romberg, eyes open or closed. And this was an immediate referral outward. Just very unlikely for someone to be in an outpatient setting without being triaged medically. All right, so here's our examination. So let's kind of focus on our patients with cervicogenic dizziness. What do they look like? So dizziness, you know, typically it's gonna be episodic, so it's gonna come and go. And unlike BPPV, where it lasts 30 seconds to a minute, these individuals are gonna complain of dizziness that could last minutes to hours, um, and even going into days. Their symptoms are gonna be more of that lightheadedness, vague dizziness, they're not gonna quite be able to put their finger on it. They're not going to feel quite balanced. And that term oscillopsia is they're going to actually maybe have some visual disturbances um, or blurring of their vision when they move their head quickly. Um, typically, they're, they're symptomatic with neck and head position. But, you know, I'm going to caution this. So the, the few patients actually I saw this week, the three patients I saw this week, not one person made their neck pain a priority. It was kind of like a secondary thing. They were more concerned about their dizziness. They went through a neurologist, an ENT, um, and ended up in our office. And we went through our process and they ended up having cervicogenic dizziness. And their neck pain was really not their primary concern, even though it was there. And so just kind of know that there's a casual symptomatic relationship with neck position and neck pain. Um, they, might not be, they might not be as obvious and say like, I have neck pain. And when I turn my head, I'm dizzy and I have neck pain. So just kind of be uh, aware, uh, wary of that. The intensity, uh, it can vary. It can be as little as very minimal to all the way as a 10 out of 10 being incapacitated. So there's a, there's a really wide range of symptoms that some of these individuals experience, um, even to the point of going to the emergency room. And now when we look at our physical exam, so what are some of the medical screening um, things that we do, well, we do our cervical stability test. Um, I prefer doing the sharp purser, checking uh, upper cervical spine stability. It's a reductive maneuver for testing the integrity of the transverse ligament. Um, there's other ligament, ligamentous tests out there, but they're provocative tests. Transverse ligament, alar ligament, aspinals, um, just know that those are provocative tests. We look at arterial patency testing or, vert or vertebral artery patency testing, our cardiovascular screen, and then we look at our upper motor neuron signs and symptoms, cerebellar testing. So our, our finger to nose, coordination, our rapid alternating movements, myotomes, dermatomes, reflexes. Um, you want to go through your vestibular examination. You want to screen through the vestibular system. And then finally, if, they've, if we've excluded all those vestibular function tests, moving into the cervicogenic dizziness testing. So we have some tests that I think are going to be uh, useful in the clinic immediately. 
um, the neck torsion test, the neck torsion smooth pursuit or smooth pursuit neck torsion, uh, the cervical joint position error testing, manual traction. Um, I put a C-spine stabilization test, so I, I, I'm not sure if it's quite rampant in the literature, but this is something that I do clinically. And then assessing for cervical spine strength, um, and not you know pure um, extrinsic strength, but more intrinsic, looking at the deep neck flexors and extensors. Um, I have a question here, what was the DVAT or dynamic visual acuity test? So this is a, a vestibular function test looking at um, uh, someone's ability to maintain focus or assessing the vestibular ocular uh, system. So we're having them look at an eye chart with their head still, and then we have them move their head at a frequency of two cycles per second to see if they can still maintain clarity in their vision. And a lot of times as these individuals with vestibular uh, dysfunction, they're going to have trouble maintaining gaze stability. They might not be able to read the same line. They might go six or seven lines above. Individuals that have cervicogenic dizziness, their DVAT scores are actually really good, but they might be symptomatic. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, so getting back to the, the cervical spine strength testing, we look at endurance and strength for that. And then finally, we just look at our general cervical spine examination. We look at posture, active, passive, and accessory movement testing. When we look at the accessory movement testing, we pay a lot of attention to the upper cervical spine. So assessing joint mobility of the C1, C2, or the AA joint. And we also look at the COC1, the occiput on C1 in flexion and side bending. So I'll, I'll kind of talk about what that looks like. But again, this is your, your traditional cervical spine exam in, in conjunction with the specific tests for cervicogenic dizziness. So first, that neck torsion test versus the hall pipe. This is a great inclusion-exclusion test. So what we have here is um, our, our patient model. She has her head looking straight ahead as her trunk is rotating underneath her. And the thought is that the vestibular apparatus is stationary and we're moving the, the neck or the trunk beneath her. So we're actually occluding or, or, or turning the head in one direction without actually moving the vestibular apparatus. If it is cervicogenic in origin, what you might actually hear the patient say is, yes, that actually reproduces my complaint. I feel imbalanced, I feel dizzy when we do that regardless of actually moving the vestibular apparatus. Um, we always want to compare it to other vestibular tests, and that's why uh, we always want to rule out BPPD and other conditions. So that neck torsion test, great test to utilize as our, as our cluster. The next test, part of our, our cluster of exams, is the joint position error test. So we have this, um, we have our patient, we usually put a laser on their forehead, we have this bullseye or chart, you can kind of see that it's uh, blocked out in a red, thick red um, lining. That's kind of our normal range. Um, the patient or the individual sits 90 centimeters away from the target. We have them close their eyes, turn to the left, and try to reposition themselves on the target. Um, the error that we're looking for is anything greater than four and a half degrees or one to two, um, one to two inches as you see on the, on the poster there. Uh, I had an individual today that I had them do this in the uh, pitch plane where they were extending, and you can just see that laser completely deflect to the, um, to the mobile side and away from the hypomobile side. And it's a nice tool to use to kind of quantify proprioception or coordinated movement of the, of the neck. So that's called the joint position error test. Um, we do it uh, in the horizontal plane, right and left, and we also do it up and down. Uh, neck strength assessment, so we uh, assess for uh, muscle endurance as well as strength. Um, we have uh, one of my clinical mentors and fellowship instructor, Ron, in the photo here, and what he's doing is he's positioning the head and neck by engaging the upper cervical spine by doing a chin tuck and he's palpating to see how much the SCM or the prime neck flexors are kicking in. And what we want to see is a quiet SCM as someone actually does a, a little bit of a chin tuck or a chin knot. Therefore, we're more so assessing the deep neck flexors, the longest coli capitis and rectus capitis anterior. 
Um, we also look at the strength test and using a cuff. Um, a blood pressure cuff works fine. There's another cuff called the stabilizer. And we have them try to coordinate that movement such that we just have them increase the cuff by two millimeters of mercury of pressure. Again, looking to see if they're recruiting their SCMs. What happens is if they're recruiting their SCMs and not their deep neck flexors, is they're gonna go into protrusion or their head is actually gonna come and lift off the table. And that's gonna be a failed test. So there's different variations of this test. There's just one variation I'm, I'm presenting. Um, but we do need to assess the deep neck muscles and the, and the strength of the neck here. And then we're going to also want to do traction. So again, if somebody's having some symptoms, they're dizzy, they're imbalanced, you perform traction. They tell you they have immediate relief of their symptoms. They might tell you that joint distraction or improving joint mobility might be something that will help these individual symptoms. Um, there's another test, the sharp purser test. It's also a um, a test to check the integrity of the transverse ligament. It's a reductive test, so I don't mind doing this. Um, but what happens is, you know, I use this as a compression test. So if somebody has some instability or ligamentous laxity or poor muscle function, when I provide some stabilization, it might actually um, reduce their symptoms. So again, looking at traction on one side, reducing their symptoms might indicate that this individual needs some mobility. However, providing some compression or stabilization might actually give you some value and tell you they might need some stability um, or, or muscle stability exercises. So it's a, it's a nice test to, to see how it affects your symptoms. And then finally, a smooth pursuit neck torsion test. So hopefully you guys can see, uh, see what I'm demonstrating here. But this test was um, uh, a pretty good test in individuals that have whiplash associated disorder. 90% uh, uh, sensitive and 91% specific. Um, the sensitivity in the whiplash associated disorder without dizziness was only 56%. So it's a pretty good test. And the way it works is you have their, their body and, and head in neutral. You have them track an object. Um, we typically have them track one of these X's that we've made, or you can have them track like a dot something to focus on and you just have them track through using their eyes only and not their head, just visual smooth pursuit tracking. Um, side to side, up and down. When we're checking for smooth pursuit, we're actually assessing cranial nerves. Um, we're also checking for uh, any component of the neck involved, such as the vertebral artery, somatosensory input as well. The next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna maintain their head stationary, but then just tr turn their trunk about 45 degrees, which means that they're relatively rotated, their neck, and you're going to repeat that smooth pursuit. And what you might see is actually a change in their smooth pursuit quality, or um, sometimes we'll, we'll call this uh, the VOR gain. You know, we'll actually see uh, maybe a, a snapping of their eye movements, or they're just a little bit slower in tracking the object. Um, we're going to do that to the right and the left because they might have a different response to the right and to the left. So that's the smooth pursuit neck torsion test. Um, and again, it's another test to be part of your item cluster to include, uh, to include for patients with cervicogenic dizziness. And then finally, I like to assess the upper cervical spine mobility. So if you look at one of the pictures where I have my four my, my hand on the patient's forehead, and we're checking for OA flexion or occipital atlantal or COC1 flexion there. And we're just looking for joint player mobility. Um, that's actually a mobilization a picture. Mobility is assessed a little bit differently, but kind of get the idea. We do central vertebral pressures to see if we provoke or relieve anybody's symptoms. Um, we also look at OA side bending, looking at how the occiput glides on the lateral mass is a C1. And then in the bottom right-hand corner, or my bottom right-hand corner, uh, we're looking at AA rotation. Um, and what we're checking for is movement of C1 on C2. When we look at cervical rotation in general, about half of your rotation comes from C1, C2. So some patients that I typically see with cervicogenic dizziness, they might have a huge movement loss in rotation um, so think about this, you only move 10 degrees to the right and 60 degrees to the left. 
eventually you're going to have an imbalance in, in proprioceptive input coming from the right and the left. So look at these, um, these joint, joint play tests and see if there is an imbalance from one side to the other. And what we might need to do is just improve joint mobility and you might restore equilibrium. Um, it might not always be synonymous with neck pain, right? So again, neck pain might not be their primary reason why they're coming to see you. I've had patients that have had no neck pain or absolutely they haven't had neck pain as a complaint, but more neck stiffness. And we've restored neck mobility and their symptoms abolished. So do these assessments. You've excluded other conditions. You've excluded vestibular diagnoses. You're at the cervical exam now. Make sure you do these joint play assessments. Um, and then again, the rest of your cervical spine examination, whatever it looks like. All right, so what are some interventions that we would do? Well, if somebody has been now does, you know, indicated to have cervicogenic dizziness, um, you know, treatments don't look that much different from other treatments that you would impart for um, the cervical spine, especially for the first two categories. So for cervical spine, pain and inflammation, we would use modalities and positioning and joint mobilizations, um, you know, positioning meaning like posture retraining. If somebody has some hypomobility, we would do some joint mobilizations, repeated movements, soft tissue, some stretching. Um, however, if somebody is demonstrated to have poor proprioceptive testing, you know, they're on that joint position error test and that laser does not come back to that center point and they're all off the charts, what do we do there? Um, their smooth pursuit might be off. What do we do there? Um, so postural awareness training is huge. Sometimes I get them in front of a mirror and they might not even know that they have a head tilt and we might have to correct their posture. Um, we start off with a lot of passive movements or movements with uh, fixed targeting. So we might just have them move their head up and down while they're uh, fixating on a target. A lot of times we'll have them go through different um, conditions where they're having to target with their eyes and moving their head. Um, I'll show you what foveal vision progression looks like, and that's a concept that's used or been presented for cervicogenic uh, dizziness. So I know I have a slide on that. And then doing a cervical spine um, stabilization program has been also very effective. We have to know that when you have inputs that communicate the cervical spine to the vestibular system and the cervical spine to the ocular system. So we also want to do some uh, treatments that include eye and head movements. And I'll show you what X1 and X2 exercises um, kind of look like in just a very simple progression of them. So let's take a look at this here. So cervical proprioceptive training, again, we have a laser in our clinic. We actually have these mazes for some more of our high level patients. Um, we rarely use them. We, we do some pretty basic proprioceptive training uh, with the laser eye and head motion. So what does that look like? You know, here's our laser right here. We'll put this on their forehead. What I might have them do is move their eyes to a target and then track the laser towards that target. Eyes, then the laser. So that's one way of doing proprioceptive retraining. They have to reposition their head and neck on a target. Um, the other thing that we, we do is, if you look at this individual with the really cool glasses, um, it's called foveal retraining. So what we've done is we've actually completely blocked the lens on one side and we've created a pinhole and it's, it's really dependent on each person, but that pinhole allows the person to see out of a very small area. And what we might have them do is fixate their head and their eye on a target while disassociating their trunk from below. Now this is really hard to do. You know, just to keep that small little image in the glasses here while trying to move the trunk, you're just associating the head and the, and the trunk. You're retraining some neck muscles in order to coordinate that to happen. We might actually have them like retract back and forward while maintaining their head on a target and eventually, um, you know, moving them in different speeds, positions, amplitudes while trying to maintain fixation. Um, you know, these are some pretty cheap glasses here. We just put some masking tape over it. And what we do to set this up is, you know, we start by having them look through the glasses and we just say, okay, let me know when you can still see the target. And we mask the tape right to that point. 
from the top down, again, from the medial to lateral side, so that they end up just having a small pinhole to look through. Um, so again, another way to, to work and drive proprioceptive training um, in your clinics. All right. Um, question about what cervical stabilization exercise progressions do I use? I think that's a really valuable thing. So, you know, I, I start pretty basic. You know, I have them lie down um, if they can tolerate lying down. And we just start with the basic firing of the deep neck flexors. Um, and we use the, the blood pressure cuff progression, the Gwen Jaw or, or Hodges um, stabilization progression, where they go up two millimeters of mercury, trying to maintain stability without activation of their SCM. We'll have them kind of hold on to the SCM to make sure it's not activating. What we don't want to see is, you know, a huge engorging of those SCM muscles as they're trying to gently nod their head. We go from 22 to 24 to 26 to 28 under control. Eventually, we might progress them uh, supine with upper extremity movements. We might have them uh, prone to do deep neck flexors prone. Now, deep neck flexors being secondary to the deep neck extensors. And eventually working them to standing and sitting while upper while moving their arms, legs, using resistance bands. So um, it's a pretty common progression um, that you might see in orthopedic clinical practice. Um, so so that's what I use. Um, hopefully that satisfies that question. And then cervical ocular exercises. This is if you're a vestibular therapist, these are vestibular ocular reflex exercises or adaptation exercises. So basically what we're doing here is they have a card, as you see on the image there, and what they're doing is they're just moving their head side to side while trying to stabilize an image or a target while they're moving their head. And what we're trying to do is drive afferent activity from the neck up to the vestibular and ocular systems. And this is where we're trying to uh, improve communication of all three systems. Okay, so X1 viewing is they're keeping the card stationary and they're moving their head side to side. X2 viewing is that they're moving the card and the head in opposite directions. So again, it takes a little bit more coordination. It takes a little bit more gaze stability. So this is, would be a progression. We start these individuals sitting on a blank kind of plane wall. Eventually, we'll move them to um, standing in a really busy background and eventually standing and walking in a busier environment, doing these head motions side to side and up and down. So pretty, pretty difficult to do. And we continue to ramp these exercises up to the point where their uh, symptoms are abolished. Um, is there, uh, so here's another question, is there, certain dosing or duration of proprioceptive training that needs to be done in order to get a training effect? It's a very good question. So um, my response to that, it's based on the patient response. So dosing and how many reps, sets, and everything we do, um, regardless if it's an orthopedic exercise, a proprioceptive training exercise, a vestibular exercise, it's based on how the patient does with it. So in our, cl in our clinical practice, um, you will rarely see three sets of 10, you know, we're, we're, we're there beside the patient asking them how, how they're feeling as they're doing each rep, how they go through the first five repetitions. We're, we're measuring not the number of reps, but the speed at which they're doing it. Are they doing it at one cycle per second? Are they doing it at two cycle per seconds for our vestibular exercises? Um, if it's the proprioceptive uh, neck training, we're seeing how long they can hold it. Can they hold it for five seconds, 10 seconds? Um, so that's some of the uh, basic exercises here. I know uh, I've already gone through my hour, believe it or not. Um, how often do we see these patients? So the nice thing about vestibular patients, um, we don't usually need to see them very often. I see our, our, our BPPV patients as quickly as they can come back into the clinic. I see our vestibular hypofunction patients and general vestibular uptraining patients maybe once a week or once every other week. Our cervicogenic patients, um, I see one to two times a week based on their response. Um, once a week with a really exhaustive home exercise program, 
um, twice a week if, if we feel that we need to get more hands-on or they need a little bit more coaching. Now, these symptoms, you know, what we, what we try to do is anytime we, we provoke symptoms, um, it's another question, another good question, um, we try not to provoke symptoms to the point where they do not abolish. So as we're going through these exercises, similar to um, you know, someone with shoulder pain, we might provoke their symptoms as we're stretching and straining. However, there's some sy symptoms should abolish once the exercise or activity ceases, or it should not be there for more than five to 10 minutes. So they shouldn't feel sick and icky um, for hours and days later. Um, here's a, a pretty, pretty fun mistake or a bad mistake that we made in our clinic. Um, I had a student and I instructed the student to perform with the patient um, one set of 10 of all their gaze stability exercises and accidentally we imparted three sets of 10. Um, by the time I came back in, it was, it was too late and the individual ended up um, having such uh, worsening symptoms that he contemplated going to the emergency room with severe dizziness and imbalance. So, you know, with orthopedic conditions, worsening is gonna be more pain, stiffness. Patients that experience dizziness, the byproduct of overtraining or overworking is gonna be, I felt more dizzy, I felt more imbalanced. So we really have to gauge the fine line. Um, the first session or two, you might be kind of working a, a feeling out of how this patient responds. My, my clinical practice guideline would be, start with just one or two exercises and build based on their response. Um, really, really important that you start off very basic. Um, we may not see this individual for an hour and 20 minutes of rehab exercises. I might just give them one or two things to work on, see how they do, and reassess. So absolutely important that we don't overtrain these individuals because their response is going to be, I feel sick, I feel worse, I need to go to the emergency room. Um, very good. So, so let me just conclude this presentation before I take some questions. So just kind of our, our review of our overview. Cervicogenic dizziness, it's a result of a sensory mismatch between vestibular, the somatosensory, and visual afferents. So again, the proprioceptors um, and mechanoreceptors and sensory receptors from the neck. Um, trauma, such as whiplash-associated disorders, is a very common mechanism um, of cervicogenic dizziness. But remember, cervicogenic dizziness in the cervical spine is not treated in, the, in, in isolation with patients with whiplash-associated disorders. Trauma and impairments of the upper cervical spine can lead to disequilibrium and dizziness. So just kind of pay attention to that upper cervical spine. I know that I've, I've talked to some of my vestibular colleagues and a lot of times is they'll impart some basic um, range of motion training and motion sensitivity retraining or habituation. But I think uh, we can do a little bit better than that. Um, we must rule out all other competing causes of dizziness. Very important to do so. Um, if you guys are really unsure on how to do that, uh, you know, you, you really do need to feel comfortable ruling, or at least screening other causes um, before you come to a conclusion of cervicogenic dizziness. And then, and once confirmed, um, intervention should include just, we got to reduce the pain. Pain itself can alter proprioceptive input. Um, we need to improve and drive up proprioception, improve cervical ocular function, and restore joint and soft tissue mobility. So. Um, hopefully you guys aren't overwhelmed. Uh, there's a lot of information out there on this. Um, for one hour, at least you have a pretty good idea of how to proceed through uh, what are some uh, tests and measures to do with these individuals. We didn't go over the vestibular test. However, you know, you have some pretty good cervicogenic tests that you can cluster together to come to a diagnosis. Um, there's my concluding slide there again. I am a clinician just like everyone else. I'm trying to better myself. So um, every, every day I, I learn a little bit more through research collaboration. So I know I'm gonna put my, my email up. If you guys have additional questions or like to collaborate on, on this, please be sure to contact me. Um, I'd like to give a special thank to our patients that have given us consent to show their videos. Um, without them, you know, learning is really hard to convey the message. Uh, just a couple of other uh, tidbits, the, the email that if you have questions specifically on vestibular rehab or cervicogenic rehab, 
use the info, uh, info at evidenceceu.com. Our, uh, our great Stephen, our course liaison, will be sure to, to field those questions immediately or send them towards me. Uh, we do have an upcoming two-day vestibular uh, cervicogenic dizziness and advanced vestibular rehab course. We go and we really break down every component. Um, for those individuals that really are not sure about their vestibular skills, we do have an introductory to vestibular rehab, and we, we start at the beginning and, and build you up to, to performing a fantastic vestibular evaluation. Um, two, two last announce, announcements here. We do have a McKenzie study group here that we're going to be hosting for those that are going to be taking the McKenzie cert exam. And then finally, we're going to be starting a vestibular study group um, hosted at Next Step Chicago and Willow Springs. Um, so more information to be coming. Um, we only get better by collaboration, uh, presenting our, our patient stories to one another. So that's going to be coming in the, in the near future as well. Um, so let me uh, take some questions. If you guys want to use the chat for any questions that you may have, I'll stick around for another um, 10 minutes for questions. And of course, if there's any additional questions on that, please be uh, beyond that, you can email me. So any questions, any comments on the presentation? How will we uh, disseminate the information on the vestibular study group? Very good question. So we have a website, www.evidencecu.com. Um, if you want, you can provide our emails there. We, we blast things on our, uh, via email or our Facebook page. Um, there's an uh, evidence uh, Facebook page, so you can go ahead and uh, sign up for that as well. So any other questions? Hold on one second here for those for those of you guys who are still on here. Did I miss anything? Facebook would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Send us a message, yeah, send us a message on Facebook. Um, be sure to like us on Facebook. Um, we see a lot of vestibular patients in our clinical practice. Um, I primarily practice out of Orland Park, Illinois. Um, we're a small outpatient clinic. We see um, probably a pretty I, I personally see a pretty good balance of vestibular and ortho patients. Um, so uh, another question, is there any evidence for incorporating music rhythm for patients with cervicogenic dizziness? I actually do not know the answer to that question. I'm always looking for outpatient vestibular PTs in the LaGrange area. Am I getting a job offer? That's awesome. Any other questions on the on the actual course content, um, up, upcoming course uh, courses that we're teaching or involved with, or the study group? Oh, just to refer, awesome, cool. So hopefully this was uh, it wasn't um, uh, it was a good topic for you guys. Here was some interest. It's hard to leave out a lot of information. Um, I tried to keep it pretty basic and just keep it an overview. If you guys would like the full, drawn-out, detailed information, we have our upcoming course. Um, I think we have seven. Yes, seven more. We have seven seats left for the course, and we cap out at 20. We try to keep our courses very small, very hands-on to enhance psychomotor skill. Uh, 